Well, if you have your Bibles and could turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 60. And don't worry, I knew things would get lengthy this morning. I won't be speaking to you for an hour. Uh, But at the same time, it's an important message that I want us to be able to explore here. And as the Lord has put it on my heart to bring this series, I have each time been preparing for it. Uh, been thrilled at how the Lord speaks through his word, both to me and looking forward to the way that he'll speak to you as well. Isaiah chapter 60, and we'll just be looking at one verse today, so you don't need to worry about turning other places. But verse 5 is the verse we come to, and it says this, Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. I want to read the same verse from the King James because there is some wording I'd like to highlight there as well. Then thou shalt see and flow together. And thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Well, I titled the message this morning, Shining Eyes and a Thrilled Heart. You'd think I was a romantic, wouldn't you? You know, it has a very romantic kind of poetic sound to it. And yet I think as you begin to hear what I have to say in relation to the way this particular verse comes to life, you'll understand why I chose the wording that I did. There are some observations, and that's really all I'm going to do for the next couple of minutes, is observe a few things about this verse and putting it into the context of the passage we have already kind of outlined and described in relation to how it all fits and how this was a, an encouragement to the Israel Israelites because they were surrounded by bad news. They were in a place of difficulty, and yet God was saying that they could rise above that and they could shine in light of all of the circumstances. They didn't have to be overwhelmed or overcome by them. They could shine in the midst of difficulty. And so if we consider that as our, as our theme throughout this, we can pull this verse out and see some really beautiful things. The way that it's worded here when it says, you will look and be radiant. As I say, there is a certain v- uh, way of looking at this verse that brings it into a romantic light. I want you to just picture with me the wonderment of seeing God work. You know, when David was talking earlier about uh, the ch- in the children's story about Jesus raising Uh, the child from the dead, and all the miracles that Jesus performed, you can imagine, because you and I both, when we read those passages, have a certain perception of what it must have been like for people to have witnessed these scenes. In fact, you can imagine how watching Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, how that they rolled the stone from the tomb and Jesus called forth to Lazarus and he came walking out wrapped in grave clothes, how that must have felt, how that must have looked, how those who had already been weeping and were already in deep grief were brought to a sense of confusion and excitement and wonderment. And I use that word because it's the only one I feel kind of comfortable grabbing, wonderment at all of what was happening. And there is a certain wonderment of seeing God at work. Now, those are uh, Bible stories. Think about your own life. Have you ever had a situation or a circumstance in your own life where you thought to yourself, that was God, that had to be God. There's no other way of explaining it, that had to be God. 
was talking to one of my daughters on the phone yesterday, and uh, it was interesting because she was sharing with me a particular instance that had happened in her life and how there was a student uh, who came along and did something. And and the way that she worded it, it was, it was just the right thing at the right time, and it was un imaginable how they knew to do that and I thought to myself I said you know why because that was an angel (laughs) and there was this sense of what do you mean I said well I personally think that God sends angels they're messengers from him and they and and his messengers do his work step in and and do this and in this particular case it was somebody at the train station the last time she came to visit and and she needed to get through to get on the train to get up to edinburgh from london and and it, the the entire um, train station had been closed as she walked in the door. These are the last people to come, and the trains were full to capacity because of strikes. And she didn't know where to go or what to do. And there was an, and then there was this this person who suddenly took the lead recognized she was going the same place they were and led the way and she said all I did was just follow behind them as they went and then she said these words this is what really made me thrilled she said and then when he when they got on the train I couldn't find them anymore after that I just they they just kind of disappeared into everything and and I thought and they closed the train door they closed the The train platform, they'd closed the train station, but she was on the train and she was now safe. And I said, that was an angel. (laughs) The Lord sends these things into our life. You can argue if you want to. You can think it was just a coincidence if you want to. I think it was an angel. But anyway, there's a certain wonderment about watching God at work. And it catches us by surprise. And that's the context. That's kind of this radiance. You will look and be radiant. And your heart will throb and swell with joy. Seeing God at work draws people together and gives them a sense of radiance and joy. I said uh, I wanted to use King James language here because it says in uh, the beginning of that, Thou shalt see and flow together. There's a certain unity. There's a certain congealing about being able to see God at work. And suddenly, even as we talk amongst ourselves in churches about the times and experiences we've had, We share instances like I just shared with you, and then one will come to your mind. You will remember a time in your life when something similar happened, and you'll say, yeah, actually, I remember there was a time, and and I, I can't explain, and we suddenly congeal. We kind of have this feeling of radiance and joy, just the the remembrance of knowing God is at work. And when that happens and you see it, there is a certain sense of holiness. And we were singing this morning about holy ground. And I thought, isn't that very interesting? That's kind of the feeling you get. Like Moses seeing a burning bush, listening to a voice, recognizing a command. This is holy ground. This is a place, some place so special where God's presence is at work. And, and we're amazed by it. We stand in wonderment watching it happen. Now, the children are back in uh, uh, the back there. And David and Paula have them. But isn't it interesting? Just, just step, Let's step outside the message for a minute. You know, churches all the time try to get kids to come. Try to get visitors from the community to come. And this church is no different. We have had a heart for all these houses that are around us. And we would do anything to try to to attract them. 
And we have done a few things. We've set up bouncy castles. We've had barbecues. You know, we we breathe the smoke that way, hoping maybe the burger smell will attract them. We try all kinds of stuff to get people to come. And then God puts on the hearts of one of our men to have a classic car show. You know, would you have a classic car show to attract kids? Probably probably not. You know, you're looking at old geezers maybe. I don't know who you'd be looking at attracting, but, you know, you'd have to have. But we were having a bit of fun. But it was God who placed it on his heart to have this, the Alan I'm speaking of, to have this classic car show. And we had this classic car show, and kids come. Kids come down out of the estate, out of the surrounding houses, and come down in, and you think, well, I, that wasn't our plan. You know, we certainly wouldn't have put on a classic car show to attract children. But God can do anything he wants to do. He just wants you to be obedient to him. And when I went home and when I thought about all this stuff, do you know what came to my mind? Just wonderment. Wonderment. At how God can work. I had a pastor in New York who got up and preached a message from the Old Testament about the you know about Josiah. And uh, he got up and it was it was thick. You know how Old Testament messages can sometimes be full of meat and and difficult to follow, and you're straining to keep your eyes open and you're listening intently. And that was the kind of message he got up and preached. And afterwards, he had someone in tears come up and receive Christ as their Savior. <laughs> you know, beg him to be able to lead them to Christ. And it was like, what? You know, I just preached from an Old Testament passage that had nothing to do with the gospel. Why are you here? You know, because God's at work and God can use anything. He can turn sticks into serpents. He can turn water into wine. He can, raise, he, can, he can raise up a mighty army out of skeletons. He can do anything he wants to do. And there is a certain wonderment when God is at work. And the third thing, and this is really the last, fear can produce good things. <laughs> You know, when it talks about the wealth of the seas will be brought to you, to you, the riches of the nations will come. I'll try to sum this up, but you know, it's interesting. We, as Christians especially, talk a lot about how you shouldn't be afraid. Fear not, we talk a lot about that. How that we should have no fear. And yet, sometimes, God uses fear in a way that he captures the compassion of people who would otherwise not be compassionate. This is what I mean by that. It, it increases. You heard the words, your heart will swell. You know, enlarge your heart. You know, if you think about tragedy, nations which go through tragic times, isn't it interesting how we become a bit more compassionate towards people we might otherwise call enemies, but we become compassionate towards them because we see their suffering. We see them going through difficulty, and it enlarges our hearts. We set aside some of the hatred we have for them, and suddenly we have a little bit of compassion because we, we see that it brings out in us something. So our fear of knowing that that could be us, we use phrases like, but for the grace of God, you know, those things could happen to us. And it suddenly brings out from us compassion. We have compassion towards people we might otherwise call enemies. I was thinking about how that, you know, they're in, in America, the state of Oklahoma, where I was born, um, had tornadoes recently that devastated towns, wiped them out completely. It's Tornado Alley, and it can always happen, and it frequently does. And it's interesting to watch that when, when things like that happen, now, 
the, the state of Oklahoma is a very conservative state, and uh, I'll be political when I say this, but I would say that as a whole, Oklahoma is probably very Trump pro when it comes to their conservatism, and they have that kind of thing. And so they wouldn't be very keen on President Biden at the time, you know, as a whole. But it's interesting. And, of course, he would avoid doing any political speeches in that state, recognizing that it's not really all that friendly towards him. But when things like tornadoes happen, it's really interesting that suddenly political labels can be set aside. And suddenly compassion can arise. And suddenly the federal government can step in and say, we're going to help you because of what you've suffered. Now what would be the natural tendency? They could easily just fold their hands and go, ha, you go where you deserved. Ah, see, now see who's going to help you. you know, there'd be all that temptation to, to be mean, to withhold but for some reason, we have a bit of compassion like that. With all of what's going on between Russia and Ukraine and how Russia is really not the flavor of the month when it comes to our compassion. If something tragic happened to the people, there would be an open-heartedness and compassion towards ones that we would otherwise call our enemies And that, I believe, is part of what's being said here. Nation can actually part with wealth towards you because of what's happened. And you can see a change take place because of what's happened. There's a word about the sea. It's interesting. The word that is used here is the Hebrew word yam. It's translated 321 times as being the sea. And it, it, what it's talking about is other nations abroad. In other words, the, we, these aren't neighboring nations. These aren't ones who live next door to you. These are ones who are on the other side of the world from you, who you would not otherwise have even been brought to your attention. And yet we have a sense of compassion towards people who are suffering. And we see that. And God's saying, There's going to be a change based upon what happens to you, that people are going to come to your aid. And you're going to see with wonderment that the only way that could happen is because of the grace and goodness of God. Because, see, all of this says one thing powerfully. God can do whatever he wants to do with whatever elements he wants to use. He can use anybody. He can use anything. He can use any nation. He can use any church. He can use any person who's in any shape to do what he wants to do. It doesn't take a formula of saying we need a church that has, you know, fantastic lights, lovely building, attractive worship group, you know, and all the things that you might think to be able to attract young people, bouncy castles, children's programs, video screens. You know, I've been in churches with multi-video screens. It's important to have these kinds of things or 3D walls. It takes all of that. People won't come if you don't. And we say, no, actually, no, no, no. Do you know what it takes? It takes God. It takes God, and that's what we want. We want to be able to see God at work in our church, in our lives, in our community, in our country. Can you imagine what it would be like if the goodness of God just flowed into our country, into our realm? And that's what we want to see. What will it produce? It will produce shining eyes and a thrilled heart to be able to know that God is at work. We want him to surprise us. We want to see the wonderment of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the way you work. Thank you that we don't have to follow formulas. We don't have to 
do it all the right way and we don't have to be what we're not and that you'll use us anyway because we love you and we want to see you work. Father, surprise us. May we see with wonderment you at work. We want to praise you more and we thank you for what you've already done. In Jesus' name.